right, everyone, welcome to the STOA. Uh, today we are visited by the one and only, uh, our favorite philosophical madman, Cadell Last. Um, Cadell, uh, he posted, uh, actually I saw it on the, the, the forum that we belong to, Intellectual Deep Web, he posted a field analysis of uh, interpretation of Frederick Nietzsche's philosophy. And it was a brilliant piece and I was like blown away by it. And uh, then he posted a sub uh, subsequent uh, Substack article, and I invited him to the STOA for a session, and uh, he agreed. And this is sort of in, in coordination with uh, Cadell's course that's, um, I don't know if it's being launched on July 15th or that's the final sign up date, but it's a nine week course on uh, uh, Nietzsche, and Cadell will talk about that in a moment, and we'll, we'll share the links uh, in the chat and on the video if you're interested. Uh, and how today is going to work, uh, we are here uh, for about at least 60 minutes, but it could be 90 minutes. Uh, I'm going to take in Cadell in the moment. He's going to um, share uh, his screen about uh, Frederick Nietzsche and the various different philosophers who interpreted his work for the last 100 years. And um, then we'll pivot to Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions at any time, pop in the chat. Colin, you can ask a question to Cadell. And we might do an open group conversation as well. So that being said, Cadell, welcome back to the STOA, my friend. Yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me. Um, I think this is, it's always a, a pleasure to come to the STOA, and uh, I also did a presentation on uh, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit here, which was, I should say that the context is that um, somehow, I forget the exact content of the, the call we had, Peter, but it, I remember it was the call I had with you, which sort of eventually led to me creating philosophy portal. So, so thank you for that initial, initial motivation. Um, and yeah, so this is the second uh, course I'll be offering through philosophy portal this time on, on Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy and specifically thus spoke Zarathustra. And uh, as I've been preparing the course and doing a lot of research on, on Nietzsche, uh, one of the things I, I wrote on the intellectual deep web and then turned it into a, a Substack article was type of a, like Peter said, a field analysis of the last 100 plus years of Nietzschean interpretation there been so many uh, fantastic minds that have been influenced by Nietzsche's work. Um, so foundationally, uh, I mean, it, it seems almost singular in terms of how, uh, just how profound uh, Nietzsche's influence has been on our culture and on our, and our society. Um, and I think that sort of getting a full, not full, I mean, this is, this is not an exhaustive list I'm going to be um, presenting to you. Um, I even think that perhaps Nietzsche's influence has been so great that an exhaustive list might be impossible. But in any case, I think getting sort of a higher order perspective on the range of interpretation that has existed in the last 100 years can not only sort of remind us how important it is to revisit some of Nietzsche's most profound works, um, but also sort of give us um, a new view on how we might be thinking about Nietzsche's philosophy in the context of our various intellectual communities. Um, and that's something I'm going to try to actively include into this presentation. There will be some people in the presentation um, who are a part of the liminal web and very much alive and very much still thinking right now. And so um, as sort of like all of the philosophy I do, I try to, as best as I can, um, connect it to what's alive in the moment. So with that uh, being said, I'll just share my screen and then uh, I have a time after the presentation for, for a Q&A. So I'm, I'm open to any conversations that might emerge from this. All good here with the screen? Yeah. Okay. So the influence of, of Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy. Um, and this is just sort of like, a, I think I've included most of the faces I'll be, I'll be talking about here, but you'll, you'll recognize many of them. They, they're, you know, it, when I was first creating the list, I wasn't even thinking about what higher order um, frame might help us make sense of just how diverse this group of people uh, actually is. Um, but I'll do my best and I'm, and I'm certainly open to other interpretations of this and I'm, and, and my sort of my framing of the higher order view of the range of interpretations is certainly not uh, fixed, let's say. It's, it's just sort of 
the first concepts that emerged in my mind when I was thinking about how can I make sense of all these different minds? Uh, how can I make sense of minds as diverse as a, a Freud and, uh, and an Osho and a, uh, and a Max Moore and a, you know, a Gerard and, and the list goes on. So it's quite a diverse list. Uh, and as, as Peter mentioned, as I mentioned, uh, this is sort of uh, something that I did in preparation for creating a course on Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which I give some context to, I think was perhaps his um, most profound work. Um, I think it represents a book which is unique within the history of his own writing process. It, it really opened up uh, Nietzsche to perhaps one of the most creative explosions uh, in philosophical history. Um, and with the, it'll be a course. We'll also have a student-led conference and uh, a student-led anthology, uh, which is a similar structure that I did for the Hegel course. So if you're interested in that, the, the final sign-up is on July 15th. There'll be six classes, nine weeks, and three tiers you can sign up for, and that's at philosophyportal.online. Um, first, I will give some background on Nietzsche as a uh, man. So, um, I, at least in sort of reading biographies on him and histories on him, I sort of identified five, what seemed like five major moments in his um, philosophical development. The first was a type of philosophical awakening uh, in between 15 and 20, which was interestingly related to the relationship between truth and pleasure, which I think is extremely important because uh, as we'll get into, Nietzsche is someone who is often seen as a type of philosophical precursor to psychoanalysis. And this difference between truth and pleasure is also something that comes up in, in psychoanalysis is fundamental. Uh, think about here, um, Freud's Beyond the Pleasure Principle uh, and the way psychoanalysis was organized around the pleasure principle, um, but ultimately beyond it. Um, then he had a naturalist secular turn. And I think that I'm also titling this the, the Jung Nietzsche's uh, Jung Nietzsche uh, era. Um, but this naturalist secular turn was basically the Jung Nietzsche was captivated by the larger philosophical moment in Europe. And what he saw as the larger philosophical moment in Europe was a naturalist secular turn and uh, a time in which um, all traditions, all traditional values, which is important for what becomes of Nietzsche's philosophy are becoming um, let's say, deconstructed, criticized, uh, reassessed, reevaluated, re um, and uh, specifically within that context, the idea of a two-world mythology, the idea that we have this world and we have an other heavenly world or supernatural world. Uh, Nietzsche was fascinated by the idea, what did it mean that an entire continent or an entire culture of people um, were abandoning uh, supernatural interpretations of the world and, and what would it mean for the future of politics and spiritual development and so forth. Then in between 25 and 35, Nietzsche was by all accounts an excellent professor. Uh, he did not produce many original works in this time. What is often said about Nietzsche during this time is uh, what, what was often noted about Nietzsche in this time is just how young uh, he was appointed to a professorship. He was actually appointed to a professorship before finishing his PhD. Um, and then he was awarded an honorary PhD. Uh, this can in part be attributed to his peculiar genius. Um, but I think it also uh, has to be said that uh, there are certain uh, larger social contexts where it was certainly more common at certain periods in the both 19th and 20th century for excellent students to be awarded professorships before they finish their doctorate. Uh, and that just simply in the 21st century is basically never the case, no matter how uh, much of a genius you are, no matter how excellent your work is, but that's sort of a deeper social context for him. And, and, and I think it's, it's interesting to note that Nietzsche did go through a period of his life where he was, uh, you could say, a normie. Uh, he was a, a professor at a university. He always struggled with his health, which is ultimately why he quit. But, um, you know, he, he was, he had gone through a process of maturation in an institutional setting. 
which I think should be emphasized because often Nietzsche is seen as an anti-institutional or an anti, you know, you should be a wild individual off on your own, creating out of the abyss and stuff like that. That actually doesn't come until his period in between 35 and 45, what I'm calling the the giga chad alpha phase where he's basically in one of the most intense creative explosive periods i think of philosophical history where all of his major works are uh generated and uh for the context of that um you know he did become more of a nomadic wanderer during this period um he I think oscillated around the Mediterranean in between Italy, Switzerland, um, France. Um, but yeah, he, he definitely didn't have a sort of a solid home base or an institutional setting within which these works were created. I often say, um, you know, imagine Nietzsche submitting a paper like Thus Spoke Zarathustra or a work like Thus Spoke Zarathustra to peer review. You know, like the, that's one thing that's interesting is that when Thus Spoke Zarathustra was first published, uh, it, it actually received horrible reviews. It was not, it was not well received and actually it sent Nietzsche into a deeper psychological tailspin um, as a result of people not at first understanding his work. Um, although I will say that, that before he died, there were actual courses being taught, the first one in Copenhagen um, on Nietzsche's philosophy. So before he died, there were people who were starting to understand that Nietzsche's creative explosion, you know, was he was on to something, that, that there was a new philosophy in town, so to speak. Um, but of course, the real uh, positive reception and meaningful impact of his work didn't happen until after he died. And, and as many people know, Nietzsche spent the last 10 years of his life um, in a total mind loss and a madness and people often uh, attribute that to Nietzsche's own sort of way of living and way of being, um, but also his uh, um, sort of potential contraction of uh, biological diseases. In any case, that's sort of an overview of Nietzsche's life. Um, Nietzsche was profoundly influenced, say, while he was becoming a professor with the pre-Socratic tradition. I'll just say here quickly that what's, what's important is that he stylistically and um, existentially uh, resonated with Di Di uh, Diogenes, uh, who's well known for being sort of, a, let's say, a minimalist and homeless and, 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 and away from civilization. Um, and he also resonated theoretically with Heraclitus, um, so he basically, in this sort of larger context of Western metaphysics, sided intellectually with Heraclitus over Parmenides as it relates to the status of becoming or being. Um, Parmenides, obviously famous for his arguments about absolute being, um, and Heraclitus most famous for his arguments about um, the primacy of becoming, let's say. Um, as it relates to the philosophical standards of his time in university, what would have been taught would have been Plato, Kant, and Mill. Um, he had a deconstructive mindset as it related to these philosophical standards. And that's oftentimes why Nietzsche will be grouped within sort of a, a, a let's say, a, like Derrida, for example, would see him as a precursor to deconstruction and will like sort of incorporate Nietzsche into the deconstructive canon let's say specifically what he was attacking in Plato was the idea of otherworldly ideas or that ideas were more fundamental than human beings. Um, specifically in Kant's work, what Nietzsche was against was the over-moralization. Um, here, uh, let's think about Kant's uh, categorical imperative and the idea that every action should be willed towards a universal action. Um, this goes against a lot of Nietzsche's ideas about uh, the creation of one's own values and the creation of one's own law. Um, and I should say that as it relates to the deconstruction of Plato, the otherworldly ideas is really the deconstruction of that is foundational for how he sets up um, the philosophical premises in Thus Spoke Zarathustra as it relates to the death of God and so forth. Um, and then as it relates to Mills, he simply thought that he, the liberalism or the libertarianism that Mill has become famous for was too simplistic um, and that a more complex political field would emerge 
um, in the post-religious era as it did sort of like with the, the difference between communism and fascism and, and ultimately the emergence of, let's say, neoliberalism with a capitalist domination and stuff like that. Um, in any case, he thought Mills was too simplistic and uh, the negation and the deconstruction of these three mega philosophical minds um, was a jumping point for what would emerge in his philosophy. Uh, and again, it's also important to keep in mind that uh, Nietzsche's thinking within the Heraclitus foundation of becoming as opposed to the Parmenidean foundation of being, uh, and he is operating with a spirit of Diogenes. Um, in, I, as, he, as he matured, as he became an adult, um, he was profoundly uh, influenced by many philosophers and also many artists and creatives in general. Uh, four of the philosophers that kind of come up as a major affirmations, even though he did end up going against Schopenhauer uh, ultimately, um, were Zoroaster, Spinoza, Schopenhauer, and Emerson. Uh, Zoroaster, he admired for the power and the stature, and he modeled his character of Zarathustra off of Zoroaster. Um, and you can see in Thus Spoke Zarathustra that Zarathustra is uh, uh, presented as a character of tremendous power and tremendous stature. Um, he saw Spinoza as his proper precursor just because of how elegant and graceful Spinoza not only writing style was, but the um, sort of beauty of the metaphysics and what many people say is that Spinoza would in some sense bring metaphysics to its completion or bring it to its highest point. Um, and Nietzsche had similar ambitions and saw Spinoza as a precursor to his own work. Um, he saw Schopenhauer as a non-moral post-Kantian. Uh, that's important basically because Schopenhauer is more emphasizing than Kant, let's say, uh, the will of life itself and, and, and what ultimately becomes in Nietzsche the will to power. Um, I think that's a, an important uh, side note. Um, and he, interestingly, um, really appreciated Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, who he said was he felt at home with from start to last. And Ralph Waldo Emerson was a great American transcendentalist, and uh, he's someone who's had a major impact on my thinking as well, actually. And I would definitely recommend his book On Nature. Um, and, and, and if you read the book On Nature, you can sort of, now looking back on it, I can definitely see why Nietzsche would be taken by Emerson and, 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 you know, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, you know, a religiosity of nature. And that, that's a theme throughout, I would say, both Spinoza and Emerson is a type of religio natural religiosity, um, as opposed to a type of transcendental religiosity. I think that's an important major distinction to keep in mind when uh, reading Nietzsche. As it relates to his non-philosophical influences, let's say, is uh, he was, as is well known, very influenced by Wagner's. Uh, he thought Wagner produced total works of art, um, like complete works, um, and he was really taken by the music. Uh, he thought Goethe was a, or Goethe, sorry, I always pronounce that wrong. Goethe was a, 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 the most influential writer of his time. He was, he was basically inspired by the greatest creatives of his time. Nietzsche deified creativity. Nietzsche deified people who could bring something new into the world that had never existed before and to do so with a type of, um, trend, you know, a, not transcendent, but like a, well, transcending the conditions of their time, not transcendent in another world. It's more about bringing transcendence into the conditions of our own time and, and our own world. And, and so he, he appreciated all of these thinkers for that reason. Dostoevsky is interesting because he thought that uh, he learned more about the human psyche in reading Dostoevsky than he ever did in reading the scientific psychologists of his time. Uh, it's also interesting to note that Nietzsche is often um, referenced as a type of foundation for what became not only modern psychoanalysis, but modern psychology. Um, so uh, it's, and it's also interesting that he felt like he could learn more about the psyche in a novel, in a fictional story, uh, than he could in a scientific work, um, which also reflects Nietzsche's unique philosophical style, which is much more narrativistic, which is much, which is, uh, thus spoke Zarathustra is story-like. Um, and he also appreciated Holderlin, who is, was a leading idealist poet. And uh, an interesting sort of philosophical note on, on Holderlin is that oftentimes, 
Uh, people within the German idealist tradition will say that that Holderlin was a, an alternative possible path to the path that eventually became dominated by Hegel. Um, but that is uh, probably uh, introducing distinctions that would require too much background to, to dive into deeper. But that gives you a sense of really what's influencing uh, Nietzsche's mind uh, and where Nietzsche was coming from. Uh, Nietzsche's core teaching involves, I think, five major concepts. One is perspectivism, that after the death of God, we are open to a rel relativistic perspectivity in relationship to processes of esteeming and valuing. Esteeming basically means respecting. And I think that this is really important to, to, to remember is that Nietzsche is not opening us to a perspectivism where all perspectives are the same and everyone's perspective is equal. Uh, he's really opening us to a perspectivism in relationship to greatness, uh, that the field, the relativistic field of perspective is organized in relationship to the overman, that after the death of God, the absolute goal relative to perspectives is the goal of self-overcoming and striving for greatness. So I, I don't think that, I think it's really important to emphasize that because I don't want to give the view that in Nietzsche's idea, we just have perspectives organized around a void of, 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 of nothingness. Uh, we do have to confront that void of nothingness, which is left by God. And we do have to struggle with the fact that the overman does not really exist yet. Um, you know, Nietzsche will often say, no matter all the humans I've seen, the greatest and the smallest are all too small. They're, they're none of them are the overman. Um, and, and that this, perspectivity is grounded within the will to power. It's connected to life. He thought that there was an inherent desire of life to overcome and expand itself, a grand striving to transcend what exists. Again, this word transcend being brought into this world as opposed to an other world. Um, and this inherent desire of life to overcome and expand itself is what he thought of as power. Uh, that's not to say that power does not bifurcate into masters and slaves, teachers and students, leaders and followers. It does. But he thought that the will to power was a singular drive, which if you investigated it in itself, uh, it was one thing. It did not bifurcate into those two. And that part of the challenge of self-overcoming was really understanding the psychological master-slave complex within inside one's own head. Um, uh, which I think is, is important. And I guess that connects to the master-slave morality because I, he thought that if you didn't really understand the will to power, then your complex basically over this would get um, projected into an other world and you would become a slave, um, a moral slave to an other world, enslaved to a other perfect world. Um, and he thought that this was generating a value system which was born of resentment uh, of the actual world. Basically, because it's so difficult to really confront how hard it actually is to exist in this world uh, with other people, with the body, with uh, social rules and regulations and how difficult it is to create. Um, he thought that because of resentment of this fact, uh, people would rather imagine existing in relationship to an other perfect world, which was different from this world. Um, and so that's, that's the sort of the foundation of the master-slave morality. And then finally, the eternal return, which is, I think, important to emphasize, is always presented as a, a hypothesis and as a fearful idea of a universe which repeated endlessly, in which no redemption was possible, in which nothing new could emerge. And his idea here was that for the people who were not striving for greatness, this idea would be so terrifying that it would motivate them towards overcoming themselves, since if everything is going to repeat endlessly, you'd at least want to be the greatest possible version of yourself that could exist. Um, and for those who were already striving to overcome themselves, this would be a, a further kick in the kick in the butt, so to speak. And the idea of amor fati is this idea that you just have to accept everything that is sort of given to you, uh, you know, to overcome any temptation towards resentment. Uh, and revenge, um, and to basically love your continued path into the future and to try to overcome. So this gives you a sense of really what Nietzsche's philosophy is about in its simplest terms. After Nietzsche died, um, there are huge consequences. Uh, there's, of course, we have to mention there is the Nazi connection 
uh, to the idea that Nietzsche's philosophy could be connected to a racist ideology and a nationalist ideology, which does not appear in Nietzsche's own writings. I think that's important to note. Nonetheless, that connection did occur. Uh, basically, the overman was connected to a master race and uh, a nationalist ideology. Um, however, there were uh, enormously polarizing political responses to Nietzsche, everything from anti-conservatives and pro-anarchists, from far left-wing activists to far uh, right-wing activists. Nietzsche can be used for many political purposes, um, and especially when I've been teaching this stuff, I've seen that there are people who uh, have views across the entire political spectrum who come to Nietzsche and uh, find value in his, his writing. And I, I hope I can express some of that when I get into the different interpretations. Um, Nietzsche is often interpreted as the foundation of existentialist continental philosophy, as well as postmodernism and post-structuralism. Um, so all of those movements were dominant and, 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 and profound in the 20th century. And Nietzsche is often seen as a you know, you can trace back the genealogy of these things, at least in part back to Nietzsche. He's not the founder of all of them, but he's certainly an important aspect of all of them. And then finally, Nietzsche really influenced many 20th century artists, poets, and creatives who uh, created some of the most profound work of the century. And so uh, in that sense, you get the view that Nietzsche's philosophy itself had a an overwhelmingly powerful effect on the 20th century um, in many different fields and, and, and controversially so. And I suppose that um, if you do have a, a powerful work and you leave a powerful work in this world, um, the effects are going to produce extremes. And so um, there's a lot to think about here. And yeah. In any case, let's get into this field of interpretation um, and, and try to go through it as best as we can. The first I'm going to start with is, is Sigmund Freud, and this is roughly in a temporal order, but it's not precisely in a temporal order, so just keep that in, in mind. Um, Nietzsche is often seen as a philosophical and an intuitive precursor to the psychoanalytic systematic investigation, so um, there are some famous quotes by Freud about how uh, he didn't want to read Nietzsche because he didn't want to bias his own investigations into the unconscious, and he felt that perhaps Freud, uh, sorry, he, perhaps Nietzsche had intuited the unconscious um, and, and in that sense was a, a precursor to the more systematic investigations. Of course, all of the, the sort of real discoveries in psychoanalysis came from studying the speech of um, the person under analysis um, and uh, sort of exploring the cracks and crevices of the infantile mind and its 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 struggles, its let's say its trials and tribulations through sexual development and maturation, um, and, and you could say Nietzsche himself was his own analysis uh, analyst um, and and really brought up some of the core ideas um, that have, that that become foundational in psychoanalysis is already present in Nietzsche's philosophy. So, for example, um, to deconstruct supernatural morality to critique Christian values as the foundation for society. These are things that Nietzsche and Freud share fundamentally. The overlap is, it, it's, it's just a, it's an exact overlap. Um, there's, there's really no difference between their views in this regard. Um, and that the truth of the psyche was not equal to conscious awareness, but related to primal drive. So I think that's also really important is that, that really, the in my, in my view, the fundamental idea in psychoanalysis is that consciousness and the psyche are not the same thing. That the psyche is a much larger category, and that category includes the unconscious as it relates to primal drives. Um, what you could say is a little bit different in Freud and Nietzsche is that I don't really see the concept of the overman or anything like the concept of the overman in Freud, um, whereas Nietzsche has a much more uh, sort of an existential project which points towards overcoming all of the cracks and crevices and things in the unconscious uh, towards overcoming the human self itself. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to think, I think. Um, however we might interpret that. Martin Heidegger is probably one of the most famous philosophers of the 20th century, and 
he wrote extensively on Nietzsche's philosophy and was influenced massively by Nietzsche's philosophy, um, specifically as it related to perspectivism. They both shared the view that objectivity was only possible in relationship to an end value, so a being toward X. So in other words, there is no neutral objectivity which exists independent of the perspective striving for that uh, object. And that's not something that is really included within the foundations of scientific rationalism. Um, and some of the concepts that, or let's say the biggest concept that comes out of Heidegger's work related to this idea is the idea of being toward death. Um, Heidegger tried to think of death as an object, uh, as an objectivity, uh, and thinking about it as our being towards it, and that the human being towards death was different than the being toward death that we might find in nature. Um, next is the end of metaphysics, that the loss of God means we've lost all objective grounds, um, leaving an abyss for orientation and clinging. So you get this idea here that because God is gone, we're opened up to confront ourselves and our striving. But the problem with confronting ourselves and our striving is that we don't have an object to orient ourselves to. We, we don't have a, so you could even say like, this is what opens up uh, radical forms of individualism um, because there is no common social object which is bringing us all together. Um, and finally that, Heidegger emphasized that when you read Nietzsche, that you should see his ideas not as objective facts, so this is in line with what we've been talking about as it relates to Heidegger's Nietzsche, that we shouldn't see Nietzsche's ideas as objective facts, but rather as things to burden us. He, he says that Nietzsche writes as if we're reading the thought of thoughts. Um, so the best example of that is probably the eternal return. So for example, if you're, I've seen cosmologists, for example, who interpret the eternal return as a, something that means something like the universe is cyclical, that the universe is gonna die and be reborn and die and be reborn over and over and over again. Heidegger's saying that that's not really how we should interpret what Nietzsche is saying, that, that we should interpret it as saying, uh, how burdensome is it for us to think about a universe that repeats over and over and over again and so that we're doomed to being born again and again and again and to live out the same life over and over and over again. George Bataille uh, was someone who engaged Nietzsche through the idea um, that he opened up possibilities for new idiosyncratic godless mysticism. So in the past, before Nietzsche, mysticism would always have some relationship to God. Um, but Bataille thought that there would be new forms of mysticism that emerged after Nietzsche that were possible. Let's say that Nietzsche, in a Kantian sense, opened up new conditions of possibility for mystical expression. Um, and specifically, Bataille pointed towards a spiritual becoming in psychosexual life, which was outside traditional religious institutions. Um, and you can see that the, the sort of the perhaps one of the dominant spiritual expressions of our age is I'm religious, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. So, for example, there's this idea that we should explore our individual spirituality in our own time, in our, in our own idiosyncratic way. Um, but I, I don't want to become caught up in a traditional religious institution. I don't want to be caught up in the social games and rituals associated um, with normative religious life. Um, and also, interestingly, Bataille thought that the way we should think about abstractions after Nietzsche is as a confessional. So one of the things that's obvious when you read Nietzsche is that he is revealing everything. He is complete. He's, he's like, he's as honest as you can get. He, he, he's, he's sharing aspects of himself and his life, which you won't see many philosophers do. Um, it makes Nietzsche very unique and original. And Bataille thought that we should take this as a sign that we treat our abstractions as confessionals. Um, and that that would lead to a situation where we can communicate what has never been said before, or even what cannot be said. So you get this idea that Bataille is interested in the way Nietzsche can be interpreted as transgressing, like transgressing limits, um, going towards a beyond in transgressing limits um, that opens up new uh, forms of socializing and new, a new type of human being, let's say. 
Next, René Girard. René Girard is a mimetic theorist who focused on Nietzsche's personal life. Uh, Girard thought that Nietzsche's personal life and relationships were marked themselves by a force of resentment for greatness. So the important thing to think about here is the way in which Nietzsche had such a deep understanding of resentment as a psychological structure, potentially because he himself uh, was resentful. So, I mean, how else could you know so much about resentment unless you were resentful? Um, so you had an intimate relationship to that emotion and that that force of resentment was related to greatness. So resentful that other people were greater than you, a better musician, a better singer, a better lover, a better thinker, and all of the above, right? I mean, we all struggle with resentment for greatness in our own way, and, and Gerard's simply saying that Nietzsche was an extreme example of this. Uh, so extreme that it would lead to psychological insanity. And so for Gerard, uh, Nietzsche went insane simply because he had no capacity to handle the conflicts and the rivalries in his social life that they got out of control. And there is certainly empirical examples of this occurring in Nietzsche's life. Um, one that might not be so well known is that he, Nietzsche actually tried to start a commune founded on a triadic relationship with another man and another woman, and it quickly fell into, uh, let's say, an existential abyss. Um, and also, Gerard emphasizes that there's evidence that uh, even a secular solitary genius is still driven by envy and resentment of what you are not. So in other words, it's not just someone who is uh, immersed within a social structure, formal social structure that can become driven by envy because of the people around him, but also the, 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 the secular solitary genius and so forth. And there's more to be said here, but uh, for purposes of time, I think I'll move on. Uh, next, Michel Foucault, who is perhaps one of the most well-cited philosophers in the whole of 20th century philosophy, um, claims that Foucauldianism is the foundation, uh, sorry, that Nietzscheanism is the foundation for, for Foucauldian critical social theory. Um, that specifically in that regard, um, Foucault attributes Nietzsche's work as helping him overcome um, Hegel, Husserl, and Heidegger as philosophical influences. Um, and those ideas that really influenced him the most was the idea of one, a fragmented subject, uh, a will to power in knowledge, and a subjective discontinuity in experimentation. So let's consider those each by turn. The idea of a fragmented subject is basically the idea that the subject, even if it presents itself to us as unified, is in fact internally divided and irreducibly so. In other words, there is no idea in Nietzsche, even as it relates to the concept of the actual overman, that um, you are whole or you are holistic, that you are one, that you are unified. Um, Nietzsche always gives the idea that there is a fundamental, a, a more fundamental fragmentation. Uh, one example I can give of that is in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Nietzsche talks about how even the overman would desire to fight an over dragon. So in other words, there is still this idea in the overman that, that there is going to be an enormous conflict and an enormous tension. Another idea related to that is Nietzsche thought that the greatest evil that had ever occurred had yet to happen and that the greatest evil would be a fantastic, even an enjoyable challenge for the overman. Um, the will to power in knowledge is basically saying that what usually people present as knowledge in a sort of objective neutral way is in fact being mediated by a will to power. So for example, and that's not necessarily to say a will to power in terms of domination, but a will to power in terms of expansion and uh, extension of the subject. So for example, this is a presentation structured by knowledge that I'm giving to you. And it's fundamentally connected to the will to power as it relates to my work with Philosophy Portal and expanding my own capacities to share and to connect with other people, for example. So it's not simply a neutral objective knowledge. It's a knowledge situated within a will to power. Next, the discontinuity in experiment. We usually think about our identities as continuities, but Foucault emphasized in his own critical social theory that when subjects undergo fundamental transformations via their own self-experiment, there can be discontinuities of identity relations. So 
could open up to things like psychosis. You could open up to things like alternative or other identities. You could undergo an identity metamorphosis, for example. Um, finally, that truth is an actively self-constituted activity that rectifies itself on its own principles of self-regulation. So that's a mouthful. What does that mean? Well, this is a transformation of thinking about the truth as, uh, let's say, God, as an otherworldly principle, as a supernatural principle, and thinking about the truth more as something related to coming up with one's own rules for life, coming up with one's own uh, processes of self-regulation. Um, and, and your capacity to self-constitute yourself in relationship to the will to power, in relationship to your capacity to expand yourself and continue expressing yourself in this world. Uh, Paul Ricoeur, Paul Ricoeur uh, opened up a hermeneutics of suspicion, and he emphasized that you should read texts with a skepticism as it relates to their repressed meanings. And he used Nietzsche as well as Karl Marx and, and Sigmund Freud as it relates to this new critique, he linked Nietzsche to the will to power, Marx to capital, and Freud to symptoms. What does that mean? Well, he's saying that when we read texts, we should be aware in the text of the own author's will to power. That would be the Nietzschean critique. We should be aware in the ways in which the author was affected fundamentally by modes of capital reproduction. That would be the Marxist critique. And finally, we should be aware of the writer's own unconscious symptoms being expressed in the writing itself. That would be the Freudian critique. So the Nietzschean critique especially is related to um, exposing or unmasking theological illusions. He thought that most theological texts and most historical theologians were mostly um, expressing their own transcendental will to power as opposed to actually uh, writing about or, or meditating on the most fundamental supernatural reality. You can think about this as the theologian as um, expressing their own desire to be God, uh, the most powerful being, uh, without really knowing it, let's say. Next, Ayn, Ayn, Ayn Rand. Uh, Ayn Rand was enormously influenced by Nietzsche. Uh, she thought that Thus Spoke Zarathustra replaced the Bible and found that Z Thus Spoke Z Zarathustra was in any case her way of avoiding suicide for a process of self-overcoming or the overman. However, she also fell into extreme resentment and bitterness, namely that she felt Nietzsche had beaten her to her own ideas. Um, and this is an example where a Girardian analysis of the historical field is, is perhaps most interesting because as Gerard said that Nietzsche's life was marked by resentment, um, we can say that many of Rand's ideas here were marked by an extreme resentment for, let's say, the greatness of Nietzsche, feeling like she could not do better than him. In any case, she did end up differentiating her work from Nietzsche's with the philosophy of objectivism. And this is interesting to situate in the context of what I've already sort of introduced in Nietzsche's work and specifically Heidegger's work, because um, you can see Rand's objectivism here as flatly and, and clearly going against both Heidegger's interpretation of Nietzsche and Nietzsche's own ideas about um, the illusory status of objectivity. Also, uh, what's fundamental to her work is claiming of a rational absolute and also at telos of happiness, both of those things are the opposite of what Nietzsche would argue. Uh, so for example, Nietzsche laughs at the idea that this world or that, that absolute rationality is possible. Uh, and Nietzsche totally deconstructs the idea, um, probably going back to Aristotle, that the telos of our being is happiness. Um, again, I would cite Nietzsche's um, sort of idea that the overman still needs an over dragon. And so there's this idea that happiness itself is not something you should strive for, or rather focus on overcoming. Next, Jean-Paul Sartre. Sartre was uh, probably the most famous existentialist of the 20th century, um, made a huge impact on French philosophy. Uh, and he was inspired by the problem of existential nihilism and the loss of meaning because of Nietzsche. Um, so a lot of, of Sartre's work, uh, probably the most profound being being and nothing, uh, was inspired by Nietzsche's existential nihilism and loss of meaning. And, 
basically agreed with Nietzsche that we have to be committed to a form of atheism, which was emphasizing that there is no ultimate purpose or meaning in this world and that we have to come to terms with the fact that there is no ultimate meaning or purpose in the world. Um, where he felt anyway that he extended Nietzsche's work is in the idea that the will to power was a uh, organized towards a project-based life where the in itself of the will to power would become for itself. So in other words, we are all mediated by a will to power, whether or not we turn it into a project, but we can make this in itself a for itself, for ourselves, if we make it into a project. So I could again give the example of like, when I create something like Philosophy Portal, this is kind of a project where I'm trying to make the will to power, let's say, for itself and as opposed to just in itself. And that, that, that comes with it a certain meaning. Um, next, Albert Camus. Camus is another famous existentialist, uh, and he felt like Nietzsche was the greatest diagnost diagnostician of the modern human condition. He felt that the death of God uh, was discovered by Nietzsche in the contemporary soul or the souls of, of Nietzsche's contemporaries. Um, and in that case, he diagnosed the metaphysics of the common person and then turned it into a philosophy. He said the consequence of Nietzsche's work is that there is no world unity. There is no final judgment. There is no absolute or permanent values and that we have to confront the void directly, which is something that Nietzsche would emphasize quite explicitly in the beginnings of Thus Spoke Zarathustra and throughout the work. Um, he says Nietzschean analysis of the human condition leads to absurdity. You should remember that Camus is famous for absurdism and also that the Nietzschean analysis of the human condition leads to existential extremism. So you could connect this a little bit to Bataille's work in the sense that Camus is pushing us to the extremes. Uh, Camus is pushing us to the limits He's saying that because God is not there as a limiting function, um, and because God is not there as a sort of rational order uh, to sort of hold the meaning and the purpose of our being, uh, that we'd rather uh, do better to explore the absurd and extremist edges of our natural existence. Next, Aleister Crowley. Crowley uh, was someone who is often depicted as a type of occult uh, or even a cult leader, um, and found that Nietzsche was a prophet for the emergence of occultism, magic, and art. You could even say that when Bataille says that Nietzsche opens up new idiosyncratic forms of godless mysticism, he had Crowley in mind, or at least was pointing towards figures like Crowley, and we'll meet more figures like that as we continue to go on. In any case, uh, he found that or agreed with Nietzsche that Christianity was a mechanism of slave morality and was the true enemy of both aristocracy and democracy. So basically a society based on um, democratic principles and sort of a, a celebration of a noble class or a, a higher class. Um, and again, born of resentment, born of, born of a type of morality which would try to level the playing field and try to make everyone equal, try to bring everyone into the same sort of level. Um, as Nietzsche would say about the rabble, the rabble want everyone to be the same because they're resentful of greatness. Um, and Crowley was uh, certainly of the mind that we should strive for an individual project that allows us to achieve greatness beyond good and evil beyond um, any moral constraint. He thought that we should strive to develop ourselves as an ethical object, but that that was an irreducible singularity. Again, there's no Kantian moralism um, in Crowley's ideas here, and that would definitely be uh, something we can attribute to the influence of Nietzsche. Next, Gilles Deleuze, who is, by I think many people's uh, understandings, the most influential philosopher of the 20th century. Uh, Deleuze, like Heidegger, like Bataille, like Freud, was uh, strongly influenced by Nietzsche. Um, and he develops, however, he develops Nietzschean philosophy into what he said is a coherent new framework for Nietzschean philosophy, in the sense that Many times people consider Nietzsche to be a great philosopher, but not someone that's capable of providing us with a coherent or a totalizing framework. Um, and Deleuze thought that Nietzsche had such a um, capacity 
Uh, specifically, he builds a coherent philosophy out of both the will to power and the eternal return. However, Deleuze challenges the common interpretations of both. So he challenge, and these are interpretations which I've already um, sort of uh, presented to you. In any case, they were important to emphasize at the time of Deleuze's writings. Uh, one of the challenges of the interpretations was that the will to power was not simple power seeking over the other. And the eternal return was not a simple repetition of the same. Um, and, and we could go into the way in which Deleuze in a very complex way um, transforms these concepts and, 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 and makes them his own, let's say. Uh, finally, he compares Nietzsche to Spinoza in the sense that they both develop theory and practice of philosophy, not just theory. Um, and uh, you can already see here from the sort of um, uh, overview I did of Nietzsche's major influences that Deleuze was also someone following this thread, that is the thread between Spinoza and Nietzsche. Um, and that, that thread was in some sense um, what was perceived to be a major renovation of uh, let's, what we could call traditional Western metaphysics. Carl Jung. Carl Jung was a psychoanalyst who worked with, with Freud and developed his own school. Jung has since become, um, let's say, a uh, huge influence in fields outside of psychology, psychology related to spirituality and religion and new age, new age uh, understandings. In any case, Jung uh, interpreted Nietzsche's God is dead, not as madness, but rather as the identification of a psychological fact. So for example, if you uh, perhaps have watched Jordan Peterson's uh, lecture series on um, uh, the psychological significance of biblical ideas, Jung is thinking in the same lines in terms of um, thinking in terms of the psychological significance of religious ideas, as opposed to thinking about the metaphysical, let's say, significance of um, religious ideas. He says, Nietzsche represents a philosophy of psychology which swallows philosophy whole, namely that in some sense, he sees Nietzsche as the final philosopher, someone who ends metaphysics, someone who ends philosophy, uh, and someone who is a natural bridge to a full psychologization of what was the metaphysical project. Uh, and I think that's an extremely interesting idea to follow and an extremely interesting idea to think. Um, however, of course, I think there are many contemporary philosophers who would disagree with that um, and, and would perhaps even do the opposite maneuver, um, namely trying to reclaim a philosophy which had moved through a type of Nietzschean psychology. In any case, uh, he feels like this swallowing of psych swallowing of philosophy by psychology was necessary because of Nietzsche's affirmation of the individuation towards the overman um, producing its opposite, namely collective herd mentalities. So in other words, he felt like um, new philosophical metaphysical projects built out of Nietzsche's ideas um, actually uh, proved that philosophy was dead and that we needed to return to the psyche. Next, Julius Avola, who is often cited as a conservative political commentary on Nietzsche, felt like Nietzsche was a, both a symbol and a cause for a man without roots in a sacred soil of tradition, who was constantly oscillating between peaks and abysses. This word, uh, this notion rather, uh, of an oscillation between peaks and abysses, um, is something that appears in Zarathustra, it appears throughout Nietzsche's work. It's something that certainly uh, captures uh, an important existential commentary. Uh, Avola thought that modernity itself was a desert that grows, which is another reference to some uh, key passages in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, and that he felt like the Nietzscheans who were uh, representing the left or representing extreme anarchism were a bottom-up threat for a revolution of nothing um, and that they would only further grow uh, this desert. He asked the question, what are you free for? You might be free, but free for what? Um, and towards that end, Avola uh, argues that one must be able to be one's own law, whatever the cost. Again, this 
connection to the creation of one's own values, the striving towards the overman, and to be unbroken in a broken world. So you get this idea uh, of a type of, um, I mean, a conservative libertarian political strategy, I suppose, and, and, and one which is uh, certainly friendly to the emergence of a, uh, let's call it a, a certain respectful authority um, that if one had really been able to create one's own laws, that we needed to find a way to once again respect authority, respect hierarchy, respect um, certain uh, movements were, which were not simply coming from a bottom up uh, anarchist uh, lens, let's say. Next, Jacques Lacan. Jacques Lacan was a psychoanalyst who was uh, strongly following in the Freudian tradition. Uh, and Lacan felt like philosophical metaphysics in general should be understood as a psychological symptom. So you'll see here a connection between most of the psychological based thinkers, uh, the way they view philosophy, the way they view philosophical metaphysics is more from the perspective of a, of a psychological symptom, more from the perspective of um, a, 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 a psyche struggling with the abyss um, as opposed to uh, transcendent reality. Uh, he felt like knowing truth was constituted by a corporeal thought uh, that speaking the knots of the sexual drive was really how we know truth. Um, and in that sense, of course, philosophical metaphysics and the entire religious tradition would be in some sense a repression and a covering up of that truth uh, and a repression and a covering up of that corporeal thought, the bodily thought, um, and also taking our attention away from what's really nodding us up inside, namely the sexual drive. Uh, finally, he felt like the will to power was an opening for a joy in this life, uh, which was finally at the stakes uh, in philosophical psychoanalysis. So uh, I would say different from Jung, Lacan is saying that he's basically challenging philosophy as opposed to getting rid of philosophy. So if Jung said that uh, you know, psychology was going to swallow philosophy whole, Lacan was more of the perspective that we needed a philosophy um, that was uh, capable of understanding the truth of uh, psychoanalysis. Theodore Adorno was a huge uh, power and mind in the 20th century. He felt like the philosophers to whom he owed the greatest debt was first Hegel, but most of all Nietzsche. He felt like Nietzsche and Hegel were the first to articulate a dialectics of both enlightenment as it related to power. So you could think about this when we think about no typical notions of enlightenment. We usually think about, for example, a Buddha on a lotus flower where they're sitting, where he's sitting there uh, in a type of uh, with meditative withdrawal. Um, and this is a different form of enlightenment than both Nietzsche and Hegel are talking about. Uh, they are including within enlightenment processes of power. Um, of course, Nietzsche explicitly in the will to power. But remember, with Hegel's work, he is responding to the power crises of the French Revolution and the consequences for modern political organizations. So uh, both for Nietzsche and Hegel, you cannot think about enlightenment as uh, disconnected from uh, dialectics of power. Uh, and finally, that Nietzsche opens up a radical form of creation that must be aff uh, affirmed against a stupefying conformity. Um, uh, that comes across in Nietzsche's work, that comes across in Nietzsche's being, um, and, and it is a, a, a testament to, uh, I think, Nietzsche's um, own sort of willingness to live a life on the edge, to live a life at the limits where I suppose creativity and a distance from a stupefying conformity uh, is possible. Uh, Derrida, Jacques Derrida, another uh, extremely famous philosopher, uh, he felt like Nietzsche embodied an anti-academic style and undermined the life ways of intellectuals. Uh, he felt like Nietzsche was a part of the deconstructionist canon, uh, someone who uh, overcame the Kantian tradition of mental categories, namely uh, Kant's a priori categories, uh, which sort of already structured the way we should think about being, 
Uh, Nietzsche has no room for Kantian categories. Uh, Nietzsche creates all his own categories. Uh, and actually, I personally much prefer Nietzsche's categories to Kant's categories. But the overall point, uh, when we think about Nietzsche as a part of the deconstructionist canon, is that uh, categories should emerge, mental categories should emerge from your own existence as opposed to being a priori there. That's the key point. Um, mental categories should be, so emphasizing here, mental categories here should be directed towards the power of life over metaphysical assumptions. So here Derrida takes a shot in terms of deconstructing uh, Kant's notion of the noumena as the thing in itself external to our phenomenological perception. Uh, Luce Irigaray uh, was a feminist writer who uh, felt like Nietzsche was useful to dialogue on issues of women in relationship to language and philosophy itself. So here she's emphasizing that uh, the way in which philosophy uses language or the way in which philosophy reproduces itself um, puts woman into a particular category, puts woman into a particular situation, or puts woman into a certain frame of being, which is itself um, blocking our capacity to understand, uh, let's say, a deeper relation to the feminine. Um, you could situate, uh, Luce was uh, part of the Derridian deconstructionist tradition, part of the feminist tradition, where we are um, here, even questioning the way in which philosophy reproduces itself through mostly the male line, uh, when you think about the, the, the traditional narrative, let's say. She felt like both coherence and closure in language was a death sentence for women with definitions of an end. So uh, she felt like um, philosophers would strive too much for coherent definitions. Um, and strive too much for a closed identity. Um, and at least according to her, that this would uh, prevent women from really being able to explore philosophy or being able to, um, let's say, contribute to philosophy in a way that is already predetermined by the very structure of philosophy itself. Uh, that is philosophy organized towards coherence and closure. Finally, that philosophers tend to define woman negatively as man's opposite, as not man or not subject, uh, and as a lacking object. Um, this certainly was, I think, also part of the psychoanalytic tradition. Um, in any case, these are her main views on uh, how we might engage Nietzsche's work as it relates to the status of this, the, the, let's say, the ambiguous status of woman in a text like Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And, uh, Certainly, the status of women in Thus Spoke Zarathustra is ambiguous and controversial. Osho. Osho was a uh, Indian mystic and guru who was tremendously influenced by Nietzsche. He felt like Nietzsche, as a philosopher, had one of the highest potentials throughout the entire world. Um, he found, he, he actually said something along the lines of, if Nietzsche had grown up in a culture with meditation, he would have uh, surpassed the Buddha. Uh, he felt like Nietzsche's genius, just like all genius, was never understood in its time because genius is outside of time and fighting against the whole past. Uh, that certainly captures uh, a Nietzschean ethos. Um, Nietzsche certainly felt like he was fighting against the whole past and and, and trying to redeem the whole past and, and says so explicitly in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. He says, Nietzsche has a magic touch that wherever you bring his thought, it turns to gold, whether that be in religion, aesthetics, or morality. So when we think about the traditional categories of metaphysics, the good, the true, the beautiful, when we think about traditional metaphysical uh, structures like religion or morality, um, Osho here is saying, let's bring Nietzsche into these worlds as opposed to um, situating him against these worlds in a deconstructive mode, probably a more constructive ethos is being offered here. Nick Land, we're getting closer to the present here. N Nick Land is a contemporary philosopher who claims that Nietzsche opens up a shamanic psyche, 
and opens up a movement from philosophical concepts to ulterior zones. Uh, in other words, trying to emphasize that a psychology, or rather a philosophy that is just focused on conceptualization um, is something that prevents us from going into those uh, spaces that Bataille would talk about as regards to, regards to limit spaces and, and transgressive. Uh, I guess Land is saying here that we should use Nietzsche to transgress philosophical concepts um, as opposed to repeating them. Uh, in th that tradition, Land agrees with Nietzsche that we should both abandon the idea of things in themselves, whether that be the Christian God or whether that be Kant's noumena. Many commentators have noted that Kant's noumena is a type of replacement for the Christian God. Um, just uh, if, if you want to learn more about Kant's noumena, there's lots of stuff online about that. Um, and that philosophy should move towards in immense deathscapes without images and beyond all integral truths. So Nick Land takes us into scarier territory. I think a lot of people would be hesitant to go into immense deathscapes without images and beyond all integral truths. Uh, of course, Nietzsche is someone who emphasizes, I think, both. You could at least construct a Nietzsche who argues for both, uh, who argues for partial truths over integral truths, and who argues for the confrontation of the void as opposed to covering up the void with pretty images. Daniel Dennett is an analytic philosopher and evolutionary thinker who was largely against the post-structuralist and the deconstructionist accounts of Nietzsche, uh, who he claims forget the importance of Darwinian science. While Nietzsche was against the notion and critical of the notion of scientific objectivity, Dennett uh, concludes that Nietzsche's philosophy is consistent with an evolutionary worldview, which I think is important to meditate on. He claims that Nietzschean morality is evolutionary, and all we need to do is root Nietzsche's morality within a pre-human sociobiological view of conflict and that we can bridge basically the animal world of sociobiology and the human world of let's say socioculture. Um, the overall idea here is that while Nietzsche may have been correct to denounce science for its Newtonian objectivity, that I think Dennett is correct to say that Darwin opens up a different form of objectivity um, than is uh, often recognized even within evolutionary science itself. Max Moore. Max Moore is a transhumanist philosopher who claims that Nietzschean nihilism is a transitory stage between religious breakdown and the emergence of the transhuman. Max Moore claims that Nietzsche's overman and the meaning of the earth point towards extensions in modern science and technology related to the transhuman, namely the overcoming of the human biological condition with technology. He claims that the heroic self-transformation through overcoming and contempt for our own biological condition is the essence of transhumanism. And so in that sense, Max Moore makes the argument that Nietzsche is a precursor to transhumanist movement. Of course, that it would be very controversial and I, I can see how he is making this argument. Um, however, Nietzsche does not himself ever make the connection between technology and the overman. Uh, so in making that connection, there is actually, I'm not saying you can't make that move. I think that's an interesting conversation. I've had podcasts talking about that. Uh, and I actually wrote my PhD thesis on transhumanism. But it's certainly introducing something which Nietzsche himself or which cannot be found in Nietzsche's own thought. Peter Sloterdijk is a incredibly influential contemporary philosopher who says that Nietzsche is a catastrophe of language ushering us into an age of narcissistic ecstasy, uh, that Nietzsche represents the end of humility, the abandonment of sobriety and megalomania, um, that his individualistic overcoming of tradition now both defines and ruins modern philosophy. Um, this is an extremely negative, of, of course, impression of Nietzsche. Um, and one can see what he's pointing towards at the same time. Uh, thus, book Zarathustra does have a megalomaniacal bent. Um, Nietzsche was writing this in a type of individualistic uh, mode of being, uh, wandering around as a nomad in the, in, 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 in the southern Mediterranean. Um, and... 
uh, one can see how perhaps he's getting caught up in a type of narcissistic ecstasy. Now, whether or not we can push uh, Slaughter Dyke's interpretation of Nietzsche to this extreme, I'm, 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 I'm hesitant. And, and, and Slaughter Dyke himself has uh, works where he uses Nietzsche's philosophy in a much more positive way, reclaiming it perhaps. And, and, and it should be noted that Slaughter Dyke himself as a philosopher is someone who, at least in my reading of Slaughter Dyke, seems to be much more along a conservative metaphysical style. Um, so one can see and one can sympathize with how uh, Slaughter Dyke comes up with this idea of Nietzsche. Alain Badu has a very interesting interpretation of Nietzsche. He's another contemporary philosopher, extremely influential. He claims that Nietzsche represents anti-philosophy as an explosive madness of the act over speculative nihilism. So what, what Badu here is defining as anti-philosophy is madness of the act itself, um, whereas he sees philosophy as more, especially post-Hegelian philosophy, um, as a speculative nihilism. Uh, where you're thinking about the nothing and you are thinking about uh, the conditions and possibility of being after the removal of a transcendent being and so forth. He claims that Nietzsche's work is organized around seven names which code a force as truth, Christ, Dionysus, St. Paul, Socrates, Wagner, Zarathustra, and Nietzsche himself. Um, of course, I could go into all of these, but it's too complex to really do given the time restriction. Um, he claims that the supreme act of the prophet, the actor, and the name together end Christian enslavement and reverses values as a first politics. What's essential here is that Badu is saying that Nietzsche represents a original politics or an arche politics as opposed to a political project in himself. So in other words, you can't use Nietzsche to build a political project but you can use Nietzsche to ground an arche politics or a first politics. Another contemporary philosopher, Peter Sostad Hughes, uh, has a great paper on Nietzsche where he argues that Nietzsche's ideas of a Dionysian ecstasy and reason's relationship to madness was informed by psychedelic drugs, psychedelic experimentation. In that sense, uh, Sostad Hughes sees Nietzsche as a pioneer of a, a psychonautic pioneer who use drugs to reveal the true depths of the mind um, and argues that Nietzsche's ideas of a fullness of an individual's past could be made present in intoxication and dream states. Uh, this is something he takes from Nietzsche's uh, private notes, um, is something that was only made possible by his exploration of psychedelic drug use. Now, Peter Sostead Hughes himself is an active philosopher who's working at the edges of a psychedelic philosophy. So one can see how he is, uh, or one can see how one can use Nietzsche to um, uh, investigate contemporary phenomena and make, make him your own, so to speak. I think this is a, a good example of that. Alenka Zupancic, who's a philosopher who I've uh, worked with and, and I've done extensive um, uh, videos uh, about uh, her work. Um, she wrote a book on Nietzsche and says that today is Nietzsche's time only in so far as we recognize that Nietzsche is out of place in any time. Uh, this is actually quite similar to what Osho was saying about the nature of genius. Um, I think Zupancic's main point here is that Nietzsche as a character, we should never think that we could take a character like Nietzsche and make him fit into time. Um, a character like Nietzsche is uh, an excess of time, uh, someone who is out of place in any time. That's, that's her major point. She says, Nietzsche is a meta-psychologist. Uh, so not a psychologist and not a philosopher, but a meta-psychologist who oscillates between nihilism and idealism, the void and the overman, and consequently opens up the conditions of possibility for postmodern hedonism. She says that we should interpret Nietzsche's philosophy not as a unity under the overman, as opposed to a unity under God, but rather a moment of one splitting into two for an irreducible tension. Again, I would cite Nietzsche's claim that the overman requires an over dragon. So you need the one splitting into two. You can't just have a, let's say, a naive or simplistic monism. 
Ray Brazier is another contemporary philosopher who pushes Nietzsche as far as you can possibly push Nietzsche, I think. Uh, he says Nietzsche's nihilism uh, or nihilism problem is a problem of what to do with time, and it's a major socio-historical problem. Um, this opening of time in philosophy is, I think, incredibly important. Um, it, 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 I think it even defines post-Kantian philosophy is this problem of time um, as a socio-historical issue. Um, Brazier radicalizes Nietzsche in the sense that he says, there is no final state of knowing, no final reconciliation, no culmination of spiritual development outside of time. Um, and, and in that sense, basically uh, opens up what he calls nihilism unbound. He says, we should negate all transcendental guarantees of a positive end, that we should see nihilism as the truth, and that that is the most transformative act. Now we're getting into some contemporary thinkers who you should be familiar with. At least they've made an appearance on the Stoa, and I actually recently did a video with Lehman Pascal on uh, Pascal's Nietzsche. So uh, this, I, this interpretation of Nietzsche was taken from my own conversation with Lehman, and Lehman's had some great presentations on the Stoa, which I would recommend. He says Nietzsche can be interpreted as a post-metaphysical integral thinker and spiritualist who's building with a new uh, plurality. Uh, what does that mean? Post-metaphysical basically means we're going beyond the metaphysics of Platonic ideals or uh, otherworldly God. And an integral thinker or spiritualist basically means that you are trying to uh, integrate new levels of plurality. Um, he says that Nietzsche's big history can be found in an energy of the will to power, which appears most complex and intense in human beings and always runs into the risk of falling into master-slave relations, uh, where one peoples can become enslaved by another peoples. And this is in terms of values. This is in terms of virtues. Um, and also that although this manifests in other creatures, because humans are so complex and intense, it's extremely hard for us to organize our will to power in any meaningful sense. He said, we can and should read Nietzsche as speaking to us, quote, liminal web players, as the children he was calling for. I particularly like this point because what Lehman's saying basically is that Nietzsche himself did not have companions. Nietzsche himself did not have, uh, he was always calling forth for his future children. And Lehman is basically uh, hypothesizing that we are his uh, future children, and so that we should read Nietzsche in this way. We should read Nietzsche as speaking to us as we continue to organize uh, our various liminal web activities. Finally, Alexander Bard, who's a philosopher who I work with closely and who started the Intellectual Deep Web and is an author of many books, which you can find online, says that God is dead is an incomplete paradigmatics and that it requires a deeper understanding of historical processes. Uh, this is uh, deeply connected to our shared work. He says that the Christian God may be dead, but God as an idea is undeconstructible and is manifest in every constructive project as the highest ideal of that project. Uh, Bard says that the ultimate constructive project is the creation of God, and that's what he calls synthism. And he argues that we should have an heroic orientation towards a techno god. Um, you might think this is somehow related to transhumanism. I don't really think it is the same thing as what the transhumanists are saying. Um, he's basically saying uh, that we should basically have this orientation towards building out uh, a sort of a super technological civilization. What our roles in this super technological civilization will be, he's agnostic about. Um, but that is the ultimate constructive project that we can engage in according to Bard. So how to make sense of this insane complex of minds? There are so many ideas here. There are so many interpretations. You can see how uh, difficult it is to really make sense of Nietzsche in the 21st century, but I'm going to do my best. I came up with four categories, which I think situated each of these thinkers in a certain way. One is a new Nietzschean metaphysics. So thinkers who think that Nietzsche opens up the possibilities for a spirituality 
be a positive spirituality beyond the religious in itself. Um, next is a Nietzschean end of metaphysics. That is, Nietzsche destroys and abandons the in itself and that is basically offering us a more deconstructive view of metaphysics. Um, the third category is Nietzsche as diagnostician. So Nietzsche as assessing the modern human condition, revealing the dimensions of the psyche that we were previously unaware of, uh, and, and, and sort of giving us deeper insight into the spiritual dimensions of our psyche. Uh, and the fourth category is Madman Nietzsche, who offers us an anti-philosophy um, who could be seen as a act that uh, destroys or undermines philosophy itself. So I've situated each of these thinkers on this uh, quadrant. Um, and so to sort of like make sense of like the higher order field, I, I think this is really interesting to investigate in, in, in one's own. Again, it's not exhaustive. There are other people I could add to the list, of course. Um, but it sort of gives you a sense of a, a, something to think about, something to think about how to position Nietzsche in the 21st century, uh, how to think about how we might want to use him for different projects. Um, and just to sort of emphasize sort of where I resonate or where I find myself resonating, because all of this was just an emergent thing in my head. Uh, th these are not a priori categories. These are things that just emerged in my head. And so I, I thought about after I constructed this, where do I sort of find myself resonating most deeply? And it, it, it's something like here. It's something like on the left axis, sort of like a, a mix between Nietzsche as a diagnostician of the human condition and Nietzsche as pointing to a spirituality beyond the religious in itself. And for me, these are deeply connected. So like, for example, we need to deeply diagnose the human condition um, in order to construct the uh, spiritual world beyond the religious in itself. But Nonetheless, there is a in itself, there is a truth, there is a deeper process in which we are all uh, somehow involved. Um, in any case, that's sort of my perspective. And uh, I was gonna go deeper into my work, but uh, I, I felt like this is a long presentation, it's gone too long already. Um, but that in the actual course itself, I'm gonna be showing you basically my own interpretation of Nietzsche. Uh, we'll be able to go into it a lot more deeply, and it's all connected with the work I've done in the past for Philosophy Portal and for my PhD thesis. This image, I'm just going to leave you as hopefully a tantalizing and mysterious image. Who knows what the hell I'm saying here? Um, but uh, if you're interested, uh, you can sign up to the course on Philosophy Portal and uh, see for yourself. So uh, the course starts, well, the course actually, the first class will be July 17th, but the, the final sign up at the moment is July 15th. Um, we're going to have a course, a conference, an anthology, and uh, three different tiers in which you can sort of make sense of Thus Spoke Zarathustra for the present moment. Awesome. Well done, my friend. Uh, Sorry that went on too long. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was, it was well worth it. And I think it would be a, um, a good artifact uh, to post on the, the channel. Um, and you're cool for another maybe 30 minutes to field some questions. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Cool. So uh, pop your questions in the chat and maybe put up your hand. Um, my, I have a few questions. My first one was related to the, the teaser uh, that you, you left us with. Um, and what I'll say, like, what I really like about you and uh, what I see and why I see you like as like, the real deal when it comes to being a philosopher is that from what I see, you're drawn to philosophies and thinkers um, for personal reasons, and uh, you allow them to deeply shape you. Um, so I'm curious why you were drawn to Nietzsche. Uh, how he is and has been shaping you. Um, and perhaps you can give us a little, little teaser on what the Cadell last interpretation of Nietzsche is. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so for me, one of the, one of the, like, one of the things that, that made me get into philosophy was that I felt like when I was in science, I was, I, I mean, I was intellectually challenged, but I wasn't personally involved as my own historical process. And so sort of like that was sort of my interest, like that's what motivated me get, to get into philosophy. And like, I, and also I, I, I don't always know what I'm doing. I, sometimes I make sense of what I'm doing after the fact. So like one of the major things that I made sense of myself after the fact was that I, I always try to connect big philosophical ideas to things going on personally in my life. And I think that's something that really attracts me to Nietzsche. 
because Nietzsche is someone who's just so honest and exposed, like he is his own philosophical project. And I find that to be incredibly empowering, not because I'm going to, like, I'm not like, oh, because Nietzsche was wandering around through the Southern Mediterranean for 10 years, I should go and do that. Like, I'm not saying we should all just mimic Nietzsche, um, but that the point is, is that Nietzsche's philosophy comes out of a deep radical engagement with his own personal cracks. And, and that's something that I think that's what, I mean, that I, I like that. I, <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Um, and the other question I had is um, uh, like one of the, the, the battlefronts of the culture war uh, that I, I think is happening right now and will become more prominent is what I'll call the, the stay human versus the transcend human uh, battlefront. Uh, basically, should we honor and maintain core aspects of our biological reality or should we overcome them? Uh, this is related to the transhumanism, which uh, was deeply, you were deeply investigating when you were younger. Um, so I'm, I'm curious uh, what you think Nietzsche's influence on transhumanism is beyond what you said about Max Moore and where he would stand on the stay human versus transcend human battlefront. It's us. It, like I had, I had a recent conversation with, uh, which can be found online uh, with um, Nikola Danilev, who created Singularity Web Blog. He's a, he's a really uh, um, great uh, mind in the transhumanist community and has been leading the, leading the conversational front line of transhumanism for some time. And I just said to him, like, this conversation is just needs to be exploded because there's so much to talk about here. And I, and, and like, I, I was actually introduced to Nietzsche through Max Moore, Nick Bostrom, um, and some other transhumanists before I got into philosophy. And so like, I, I just think this is a really interesting thing to think about. One thing I'll leave, and I don't have final answers, but the one thing I will say is when Nietzsche opens Thus Spoke Zarathustra, he makes one thing painfully clear, which is that the human being is a process or a bridge. And that the human being as a process or a bridge is not something that's going to be eternalized. Meaning we should not imagine the human form as existing here forever. And I think a lot of people unconsciously have the view that the human animal will be here forever. But actually, one of the things that motivated my PhD thesis, I've actually never really said this. Uh, I, I've never, I haven't said this in a long time. But one of the things that originally motivated my PhD thesis was a, was a thought experiment, which is it's very, very easy in evolutionary history to imagine dolphins or chimpanzees or lions or whatever animal you like we could imagine those organisms existing in more or less a similar form for the next three, four, five million years. No problem. However, the, it's hard to imagine the United States of America existing for three million years. It's hard to imagine India and China and all of the political organizations and ways in which we think about human, like ancient Egypt was a long time and that was like a couple thousand years. The human organism does not give the appearance of something which is going to exist for millions of years. There's something so insane about the human organism. It's almost like, well, I like what Nietzsche said. I think we're a bridge. We're a bridge or a process. Now, what is that bridge or process towards? Is it the overman? What is the overman? What does that mean? These are the types of ideas that I want to explore in the Thus Book Zarathustra course. It's probably something that will take up a lot of my career. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to have final answers about it. But I think these are the ways in which, we, like, one of the, like, I, I think I said in the intellectual deep web one time, Hegel's phenomenology of spirit is the equivalent of a tweet, which takes 200 years to, to decipher. And I think that when we approach philosophers, we should be thinking in terms of like, when you read Thus Book Zarathustra, you're not like, yeah, you, you can't solve. It's not something like you solve. It's something like you wrestle with and like, it's going to stay with you for a long time. So I think that, that, that basically, if people are laboring under the assumption that the human being is eternalized, I think Nietzsche gets us out of this mode of thinking. Cool, cool. Um, you know, I'm going to sneak in one more question before I take in um, Ariel. Um, <clears throat> this is related to the transhumanist kind of thought. Uh, I see a lot of uh, traditionalist, uh, reactionary, and heterodox thinkers um, are seeing and predicting a philosophical marriage between transhumanism and transgender thought. Um, and I'm curious how you see Nietzsche's influence on the latter is on transgender philosophy and perhaps uh, more generally wokeism. 
Well, okay. When it comes to wokeism, I see that like specifically Nietzsche's passages on the rabble seem to me to be, he's exactly describing the phenomenon of woke and its negative aspect, namely this idea to level the playing field. So like that basically like, anyone who appears as great or anyone who appears as powerful needs to be leveled or brought down in some sense, like by the mob mentality, by the herd mentality, the tarantulas, exactly, Kevin. Um, as it relates to transgenderism, I do think that Nietzsche has a positive, I do think that, I, I also see this potential marriage, which it's fascinating to me, especially something that I would like to apply dialectics to, what is the potential relationship between transgenderism and transhumanism? One, the trans, trans, uh, the people interested in transhumanism are usually technocratic masculine figures and not exclusively, not exclusively, but tending in that direction. And transgender people don't necessarily seem to be technocrats in any ideological sense, but nonetheless, a lot of the technologies that make transgenderism a cultural phenomenon are merging from a transhumanist ethos or emerging from a transhumanist culture. So the merger between these two things is fascinating. And, and I actually, <laughs> the funny, I'll, I'll leave you with an interesting thought. So like one of the major thinkers in transhumanism that influenced me was Ray Kurzweil. And one of the things I often note about Ray Kurzweil is that he has explicitly and publicly expressed that one of his desires is to uh, have sex as a woman in a woman's body. So just to hear, uh, here to express the idea that um, sexual fantasies, being able to explore your body how you want to, like one of the things we don't often think about as a negative fact is that we don't choose what bodies we appear in. Like, and, and transhum like one of the things that transhumanism opens up is that, like that you can have more freedom. Basically it opens up new conditions of possibility for the body. And I think that we have to interpret this in some sense in the context of exploring the will to power and sexual drive. And so, and just this, like there is something devastating in transgender, like there's a devastating truth in transgenderism. I think that truth is that like conserv when conservatives say that men and males or women and females are the same thing, they're wrong about that. Like there is a gap. <laughs> like there's a, like, just because you're a female, that doesn't mean you're going to become a woman. And just because you're a male, that doesn't mean you're going to become, become a man. <laughs> there's a gap. And that gap as a truth is where transhumanism and transgenderism is uh, super interesting to think. <laughs> Yeah, totally. That's, that's a whole session of itself. Um, so we got a, a few uh, questions in the chats. Uh, Ariel, if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, yeah, um, thank you. This is really interesting. Uh, I'm curious, like relative to all these thinkers, and in particular, like with regards to these four quadrants you described, uh, where do you think Nietzsche would be situating himself? Or who do you think he'd be resonating with? Or who would he think would be kind of missing the point if you were around today? It's, it's, oh, that's, that's, it's, thanks for an impossible question. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it's a, it's a tough, that's a tough, that's a tough question. I mean, I think, I think so, like, on the, like, I mean, I think you, you could, you could obviously make an argument for any of them, but I think the one he would obviously be least gravitating towards is probably the one that sees him as a mad, a mad anti-philosopher or something like that. Um, in the sense, like, I think, I think what, like, I think what's explicit in, I think, okay, I'll say this. I'll say what's most explicit in Thus Spoke Zarathustra is an oscillation between the end of metaphysics and the beginning of a new type of spirituality. So in that sense, he would probably most gravitate towards the top center of the quadrant. That's a little surprising to me. Um, like it, it seems like there's, yeah, that's that's interesting. It's interesting that he would resonate at all with the spiritual side. It's that's surprising to me. <laughs> 
Well, I think I'm saying that because in, in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, it's like there's a meta narrative in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. It's like he's starting off by saying, God is dead. The Christian metaphysics is over. That truth is, is gone. So that's why I'm saying it's connected to the end of metaphysics. And then throughout Thus Spoke Zarathustra, what he's trying to call forth, constantly trying to call forth, and he never quite does it is he tries to call forth what he calls his future spiritual children, which will build a new metaphysics or a new world. And so that's why I would see him as like an oscillation between those two. And like he even ends the spokes Zarathustra by like saying, my, my future spiritual children are not here yet, but I know they're close. So like that's why I, that's why I like Lehman Pascal's interpretation that we should see Nietzsche as speaking to us today, like that we are his children. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Ariel. Uh, Raven, uh, you had a question. Hello. Hi, Kado. Hey, Raven. Great to see you. Oh, it's good to see you too. I was wondering if Nietzsche has any philosophical musings about birth and both birth as a physical process, physical biological process, but also as a kind of transcendent category of creation. And if there's any conversation that he has about the differences between men and women in their, in their creative capacity in his work. Hey, yeah, two good questions. So the first thing, <clears throat> the first thing about birth, there's a dominant metaphor throughout Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which runs along the lines of camel, lion, child. And camel is a metaphor for, and all of this is a metaphor for a spiritual metamorphosis or a spiritual transformation. So the camel is basically the spirit that carries and disciplines, it carries a heavy load and disciplines itself just for the sake of carrying a heavy load, just for the sake of disciplining itself. The lion is the spirit which tries to find its own desire and hunts out its own desire, irrespective of the cost or the danger. So it's, so in other words, the transformation from camel to lion is basically, I know I've been carrying this heavy load, but I don't really know what I desire. And so the lion goes after its desire, even if it's risky, even if it's dangerous. Then the final metamorphosis is what he calls the child, which is basically a type of affirmation of life, like yes saying to life. In other words, the child is the child is a metaphor for the spirit, which sees everything as new all the time. Like, so I, I often say, like, for example, I try every day I wake up, I try to have the, the mentality that I'm being born for the first time. Like when, like whenever I wake up from a nap, for example, like I have this feeling of being refreshed. Like I have this feeling, like, and, and even if I feel like too heavy, like I, if I feel like the camel, then I have to have a nap because then I wake up and I feel like the child again. So there is this idea that it, Nietzsche's metamorphoses of spirit and what he sees as the enlightened being is the being that's almost at the first principle of being, which is the child. So that can be interpreted and embedded into a larger metaphysics that Nietzsche has about the family, but I'm trying to emphasize its dimensions in the individual for spiritual becoming. And then as it relates to like giving birth to oneself, and as it relates to the man and the woman, what I will say is this. So, and this is something that I think it's interesting to think about more. So Nietzsche's philosophy is without question organized around a common horizon that's self-overcoming, the overman. However, within that process of self-overcoming, he does respect and accept sexual difference. Namely, men and women self or it's because we appear in the bodies that we do that we may have different challenges as it relates to self-overcoming. And he does seem to say that, like, I don't think he essential, like the, the tradition, like he's not a traditional conservative in the sense that a woman's major goal is to have a child and to become pregnant, but he does emphasize that that does handle a lot of the meaning crisis for women. Not all women, but like, it's so it's again, like all the nuance is in the gap. So like, for example, what the conservatives do, the conservatives never leave a gap. So like, they basically say, woman's goal is the child. 
And they don't leave the gap that actually, no, there are many women who don't have that goal. And there are many women who are fine without having a child. But so he's basically trying to communicate that if a woman does have a child, that her overcoming is to raise the overman or to give birth to the overman. If she doesn't have a child, then it seems to me that her self-overcoming should just be on the same level as the man or the same way as the man. But it seems to a lot depend on, like, it seems to me, like, anyway, like, this is like, and I'm like, let me just reflect in my personal life, like, this is the biggest decision. Like, do I have a child with a woman or do I not have a child with a woman? Because it seems like that decision, so much hangs on that decision. And I had a talk with Pamela Von Sab Sab uh, Sabaldar on, on my YouTube channel about women. And we talked about this and we talked about how in sexual education, we do need to emphasize more that like, if me and my partner had a child, that would have a much more profound physiological and biological impact on her life than my life. And that as a result of that, that the woman in some sense has an, an initiation process into maturation, which the man needs to artificially construct. That's that. But it's like giving actual birth, like it's like Nietzsche seems to, Nietzsche seems to, like one, Nietzsche like has some passages where he's saying, you like, if you've really overcome your senses and if you've really become virtuous, you should like get married and have lots of kids. Like, that's, like, <laughs> like he has passages like where he says like, get married and have lots of kids as long as you've like, like done the self work, so to speak. Like what he doesn't want is, he said he wants your freedom to, to yearn for a child. He says he doesn't want your child to come out of loneliness. He doesn't want your child to come out of self discord. He doesn't want your child to come out of um, uh, like a, like a, unconscious desire craving that's hot <laughs> fantastic i feel like i could go on about this for a long time so <laughs> um thank right. you that's wonderful all right uh simone uh while she's staring at uh her child uh had a question that she'd like me to read out and perhaps this could be the last one um, could you unpack how Nietzsche understood the overman? Did it have specific qualities or was it more about the striving? And it's I think the first trap in thinking the overman is like reifying it as an objective destination. Like it's like, like a final resting point. Like, oh, I finally made it on the overman or something like that. Like there's nothing in Nietzsche's writing that I've found that sort of points in that direction. The overman is basically always going to be like, to me, like this orientation as a process of self overcoming. And like, if you could say like, there's a qualitative transformation that occurs within the overman, it's that the overman doesn't see struggle or conflict or hardship as a negative thing. The overman sees struggle and conflict and hardship, hardship as like juicy. Like, ooh, that's, that's alive. Like I'm alive. Like, like, let's, let's figure out what this is. Like, let's, let's, oh, a new challenge. A new, a new experiment, a new experiment, self-experiment, a spirit science, self-test. And I imagine if you want to find out more, you can sign up to Cadell's uh, upcoming yeah, course. That's uh, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> leave him something. Uh, Cool. Um, cool. So yeah, let's uh, let's gently close here. Um, any uh, parting words you'd like to leave uh, people here today at the store or anyone watching, um, Cadell? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Like, just yeah, I mean, thanks to the people who showed up and 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 for for your for your time. Um, I will say that just as, as I emphasized at the beginning of the Q and A, for me, philosophy and the personal are fundamentally interconnected, that you shouldn't be intimidated by philosophical concepts in some way getting in the way of your own personal investigation. I see the potentiality of this philosophical concepts to 
enhance your capacities to interpret what's going on in your personal world, to make sense of what's going on in your personal journey, and to see your the, the cracks and the negativities or the, the problems in your uh, personal life as philosophical material. Like there's really interesting things in the cracks of all of our lives and paying attention to those cracks is like, if I could say just final thing I'll end with is like, when I first became an intellectual, like I was looking for something that was like really far away from me. Like I was like, I remember being, I remember being fascinated by like the deep uh, space telescope pictures of like the galaxies, uh, billions of light years away. Like, oh, wow. But like, the more I've gone into philosophy, the more I found like the closer I get to myself, like there's a lot of juice and amazing stuff there. And so like, that's at least how I've experienced my journey. Yeah, and that's why I'm a big supporter of your work, uh, the, the personalization of philosophy. Um, and I'll continue to support it uh, by um, uh, hyping up your events. And then the next one is coming up. Is it on July uh, 15th again, or is it? Uh, the, first, the first class will be July 17th. I've got the final sign up right now is July 15th, but I might shift it to July 16th. We'll, we'll see. Beautiful. Uh, and so I'll post that uh, perhaps for Patreon supporters and then um, uh, on the on the video notes. Uh, so that being said, uh, Cadell, everyone, thank you so much for coming to the store today. Thanks. All right. Peace out, guys. Thanks for thanks for attending. Thank everyone. you.